Hello everyone, Simon Jacobson here. Due to the regards from the snow here in New York, we're doing this class online. For many of you, it makes no difference because you always watch it online. But um, just mentioning that. And we'll be discuss, discussing restoring our faith in humanity. Restoring faith in humanity. So here's the question let's be, that we'll begin with. We always try to begin with a provocative question. Can we trust human beings? If you read, for example, Steven Pinker in his latest book called The Case for Reason, Enlightenment Now, The Case for Reason, Science, Humanism, and Progress, he makes the case that all human progress is solely due to human beings where human beings have replaced the magical idea of a god or other type of primitive beliefs, and is the march of human free inquiry and mind of the human being, to just read his quote, quote from him, the Enlightenment is working, he writes. In his opinion, people do not need to believe in magic. A fire, a father in the sky, a strong chief to protect the tribe, myths of heroic ancestors. Our ancestors replaced dogma, tradition, and authority with reason, debate, institutions of truth-seeking. They replaced superstition and magic with science, and they shifted their values from the glory of the tribe, nation, race, class, or faith toward universal human flourishing. Secular, liberal democracies are the happiest and healthiest places on earth. Un end of quote. On the other hand, if you ask many survivors of the Holocaust or other human travesties, whether personal or communal or global, they will quickly remind us that, if anything, the Holocaust taught us that you cannot believe in man any longer. And all we have is God in whom we can trust. And when you look around in the world of the, sec the, sur the, the secular you look at the, uh, in the world of the secular world and relying purely on that and how people have treated each other, it makes very much sense when you see the corruption, when you see the um, crimes, you see the selfishness that human beings can perpetrate on each other. It becomes very obvious that there's no reason to be, that we can be very cynical about the human race. And quite on the other hand, comes another question, and that is, and that is, the fact is that human beings were created in a divine image, charged by God with free will to improve this world. So God entrusted us. So then again, it would seem that we could trust human beings. So how do we make sense of this whole thing? And how do we turn this into a, uh, a modality that we can talk about both on a personal level? I'll never forget the class I gave many, many years ago. I was sitting, it was on 81st Street and uh, West End Avenue. And um, I was talking about unconditional love versus conditional love. And I was discussing at the time the, the virtues of unconditional love, where you really can love somebody knowing that, the, that you, knowing, that you, knowing that you receive love without any conditions. And while I was speaking and discussing it, there was a guy sitting right to my right, and he began to mutter, began to whisper. And he started getting louder and louder, the, to the point that he said, to the point that he said, um, he started saying and speaking up loud, he st started saying, yes, unconditional love. The only unconditional love you have is from, from, an, from a dog, from a pet. You can never trust human beings. And he was speaking like to himself, clearly had something troubling him. And the whole room was maybe 90 people there. And everyone started getting very disturbed because he was like just starting to get louder and louder. He says, you can't trust human love. Like with so much anger and so much uh, vitriol. And finally, one woman in the back of the room said, can you just be quiet? We came here to hear Rabbi Jacobson. And he just got even more furious. I remember he stared at her with this with these set of eyes. He looked at her. He says, you're so shallow. And everybody was looking to me how I'm going to react. So I said, you know, I knew who he was, and we met him. We'd come to previous classes, and I said, "You know, tonight we're talking about human love. We'll talk about canine love another time." And he said, "Okay, I understand, Rabbi. I respect it. Fine. I'll just tell you a little footnote. Then the story. 
when we get back to why I'm telling the story, was um, that night after I finished the class, a woman came over to me and gave me a note in an envelope. And uh, she said, read this when you have a chance. I got back home. And I say this simply because it was such a moving moment. She writes to me, I've been to your classes many years, but I've never learned as much as I learned tonight how you treated him with respect. You could have easily mocked him and everyone would have understood that something's the matter. You know, talking about dog love, you're talking about human love, and uh, you treat him with such respect, and I learn more from that from everything that you've ever taught. Now, what did happen here? I don't know his story, but I know that people go through their life experiences, and clearly he must have grown up in an environment where he could not trust human love. And as painful as this is to tell, but it's one of the early, early experiences where I first began to hear about the horrors that human beings can hurt each other even parents to children, even close loved ones, and so on. And that was when a fellow who was coming to my class for a while said he wants to speak with me privately. He came to my office, and we sat down to speak. He clearly trusted me. I was maybe, it wasn't, I was a good t- 10 years younger than him, very inexperienced. And he says to me, I want to share with you something confidentially. I learned love from a dog. Those were his words. And I, like, like taken aback, I didn't react. But internally, I said, what? What, did, what, is, what is he saying? I wasn't even sure what he was saying. And, but I, I, was, I, mean, I always respect what people say because you never know where they're coming from. And he explained, he said, when he was a child, growing up in his home, his father was an alcoholic. And he would come home, and sometimes in wild rage, he would say he would lunge after my mother to beat her. And being the oldest, I would get in, the, in between and he would beat me instead with a baseball bat. Sometimes I was black and blue and swelling all over my body. And I would go out onto the yard and sleep there all night and at the, near the kennel where the dog soothed me. That's where I learned love, not from my father, from the dog. And I never left that impression. I left. First I thought to myself, you know, I never had, had even heard or tasted anything close to this. I, I thought, what's? couldn't believe it. But that's what he said. And then I realized, unfortunately, we live in a world where human beings can behave worse than animals. And I never left my impression. So when someone said that, no matter if it sounds strange or not, to always know people go through life experiences and never know what they're going through. And always give them the benefit of the doubt because you never know. And even though something may sound bizarre or weird or strange, the key is for us to be sensitive hearts. I go back to the topic because here's where I heard for the first time Humans can behave that way. Like he said, you can't trust human beings. Now, I personally, full disclosure, I've never been hurt by a human being in that fashion. So I do trust. I can't say I'm completely naive. We all have our guard up and we're always wary, especially as you get older, you become more more attuned and more, more aware of how people can hurt each other. But there's an element of trust. But I could see people growing up in homes and environments that were so violent and so... Um, um, what's the word I want to use, so uh, uh, violated their boundaries that they could come to a point where I don't trust human beings. Which only adds to the discussion we spoke about before about the trust, restoring trust in humanity. You look around today, for example, so thank God we're not living in the time of the Holocaust. But nevertheless, we live in a time where you could see in the media how people can become completely consumed with their way of looking at it and they're ready to kill anyone that doesn't agree with them. I don't know, kill physically, but, but speak in a way and completely intolerant. So there is killing somebody with a stick, and there's also killing somebody with words. The Talmud even speaks about embarrassing someone, which is compared to death. Why? Because it says a face has blood rushing in it. And when you embarrass someone, it's called Malbim Pnei Chaver, you make his face white because it causes the blood to leave his face. So that's a form of killing. You're causing, you drawing out his blood. And from red, it becomes white. From a red face, it becomes a white face. So there's many ways of hurting each other. And we've seen human beings at their worst. But we've also seen human beings at their best. So I'm not denying that Pinker has some points that we see human beings creating healing, acts of, of, of uh, nobility, and other things that have changed the world for the better. So when you talk about trust in human beings, do we have trust in human beings? We really have to look at all angles here. On one hand, we've seen people at their worst, and we've seen people at their best. So how do we make heads or tails, and how do we look at this? And also, how do we look at ourselves? Can we trust ourselves? 
You know, you hear all these horrendous stories where people get stuck in an avalanche. P- perfectly normal people can turn on each other when they're dying from hunger and they'll look for the weaker one and actually end up cannibalizing that person. You say to yourself, would I ever do such a thing? Of course not. But who knows, under certain duress, certain pressure, how would we behave? You see people during the Holocaust, during the former Soviet Union, turned against their brothers and sisters to save their own skin. And others would not. Is it because we're wired differently? So you start asking yourself, you know, what is my ugliest side? We many often know, I don't know the ugliest, but we know of our ugly side. And then we have our beautiful side, the angels within. So when you look at what, take, uh, what I've discussed many times, the Darwinian, Freudian model of um, social Darwinism, some call it, of the id, that the driving force is survival of the fittest, the id, the selfish id, in the words of, of Freud, take pleasure, my pleasure, me, me, me. And everything orbits around me. So when you think of it that way, then you're dealing with, of course, this, the, the, the ugliest part. But we have an ego and a superego and other forces at work that superimpose themselves and create some control, like red lights, green lights, for there to be coexistence. You take that approach, so then the uglier side of the human being is really the dominant one, but it could be kept at bay. What is the approach that I will share with you, coming from the Kabbalistic and the mystical and the Torah tradition, is that we have actually two voices and two personalities within us. One is called the divine personality, and what's called the divine soul, and one is called the animal soul. And they're both e- equally powerful. So that when you look in the Bible, the first description of the human being created in the divine image. That's a beautiful divine an angel, more than an angel, something created in the divine image. You read chapter 2 and it says, that there's a side of a person that's ra, evil from childhood, selfish from childhood. Is this a contradiction? No, two souls. The entire book of Tanya, written by Rabbi Shneur Zalm of Liadi, we're going now back uh, 200 and, it was published in Tovkov Nutes, it was published in uh, 1799, um, 1799, yes. Um, so you're talking about, um, we are now 1800, 1900, 2000, 218, 18, 19 years ago. So he makes it very clear and establishes there are two souls based on Kabbalistic writings, two voices, two souls that are pitted against each other, each with equal powers. Because that is the purpose of existence, is to have exactly those two voices, and they battle, and that you use your intelligence, and you use the the blessings and the resources you were given to make sure that the divine soul dominates over the animal soul. And as he puts it brilliantly, the divine soul resides in the mind which is reflective. The reflective mind is what really can create the objectivity and the determination as it reflects what's right and what's wrong. Whereas the, the animal soul resides in the impulsive heart, and impulses, whatever comes your way, you're, you, you're seduced by it, and you're distracted by it. So it's really like the mind and heart battle, battle, you can say, with the hope that the mind will prevail, which doesn't always happen, of course, because the heart and the impulses are very strong, and something comes your way, you want it, whether it's good for you or not good for you, whether it'll cause damage to others or won't cause damage to others. You want it. Comes the reflective mind is most to is, is to keep that, harness it, control it, keep it, discipline it, and, and basically be in control of a human behavior. Little children, of course, their hearts and their impulses are the dominant force, and you can't expect them to not cry when they're hungry, when a newborn is hungry. But as, they, as we grow older, and this is the, Kab- the, Kab- the masters, the Kabbalists, the mystics, explain the process of maturity, how as the mind develops, it becomes more and more cap- capable of controlling the impulses of the heart, and that's why we can expect things from adults differently than from children. And that too, there are stages. The young stage, less mature, more mature, as we grow into full-blown adults. Unfortunately, there are many people chronologically are adults, but they've never grown emotionally. The emotional intelligence that comes with the control of the mind, harnessing, directing, guiding, and advising and informing the heart where it should act, where it shouldn't act. 
It's a long discussion, which is not really relevant to our point here, but I just wanted to dry, lay it out. So in that sense, the human being really has two sides to it. One side, which is a, can be a beautiful and angelic and divine side that searches for transcendence, that seeks to transform, seeks to serve, seeks to give, to help others. And there's another side in the human that is very animalistic and very much my survival comes first, a taker instead of a giver, dealing with material success, material survival, the here and now, instant gratification, without, without considering the consequences. And these two forces are a battle with each other. So there's your question. So there you can have the answer. Do we have trust in humanity? The answer is, depends which part of the human. If the human lives up to the noble side, obviously we have trust. If it does not, we don't. So then we're back to square one. The answer is that we need to dissect and understand what makes a human being a human being. What makes us, what makes us tick. When we build trust with a human being, what we're learning is that we see that that person is not perfect. They can make mistakes. But you see that, they're, that uh, I would say the majority of the time, or at least their tendency is, an inclination is toward the divine side. That's how we build trust. Trust is not built on perfection, my friends. Trust is built on accountability. So when you find someone in your life, let's, talk, let's start from the childhood stage. In your childhood, all children trust their parents until, God forbid, they're forced not to. They trust their parents, which is why it gets so pa- painful and so, so complicated, because when the person you trust blindly, the person who's supposed to love you, care for you unconditionally, nurture you, validate you, turns on you, or in some way undermines you, in the beginning you don't want to believe it, even blame yourself. But at some point in healing, you come to discover someone is abusive, a parent, you realize it was them, not you. But the damage is very deep. The wound, I should say, is deep. Everything can be healed, but the wound is deep. If it's healthy parents, and they nurture and validate and reinforce and and build that confidence and self-esteem, then what are you having? Then you have trust. That trust will spill over to other relationships. Trust in your siblings, trust in your community, trust in your classmates, trust even to strangers. But you come to learn that there are people that can be hurtful, so you have your protection, you have your defenses. That's in a healthy environment. If it's an unhealthy environment, you become distrustful. And that becomes your status quo and your default state. First, guilty until proven innocent. Growing up in a healthy environment, it usually is innocent until proven guilty. Growing up in an unhealthy environment, which means, a healthy environment means where you can, you learn to trust people early stages of your life, innocent until proven guilty. Growing up in a home or an environment that there is distrust, then guilty until proven innocent. So these, the factor of trusting humanity is very much dependent on our experiences, and which side of humanity we have experienced, the, the beautiful side or the ugly side. Now, this doesn't mean even if you experience the beautiful side, you can't meet a person who can be very hurtful. That's where you have to be wise and say, even though, yes, it's true, I grew up in a beautiful home and have many things going for me, nevertheless, there are times people you meet that are obnoxious, and you, get to be, you have to be careful, you never know. There are users, there are predators, abusers, and so on. So a mature person comes to a balanced place where they navigate that way and they meet people. And with time, they can develop a relationship with a friend and they say, you know, it's a person I feel I can trust. And you allow them in. There's always a risk, especially when it comes to romantic and personal emotional relationships with a potential spouse and marriage and so on. You become vulnerable. We, of course, you could be hurt. But that's part of life. It's not perfection. It's accountability. So you build trust, you start building trust. Now, if you come with good tools, that trust will be an available tool for you, an available resource, which you'll use and help you tremendously in life that you don't have to walk around in eggshells and constantly in fear and looking over your shoulder and second-guessing yourself, can I really trust that person? Which is a big issue when it comes to relationships and dating. People say, I can't, I don't know if I can trust that person. And it may necessarily, not necessarily come because that person has done anything wrong. It could be your own history is a distrustful one, and for maybe for legitimate reasons. So this is how we address the whole topic, by looking at the human being and realizing there are two forces. And then you look, what you want to look for is, where does the person gravitate to? What are they inclined to do? What is their aspiration? 
Some people have no problem. They may not say it, but they have no problem feeling selfishness is my first step. They may not announce it and they may hide it, but you can pretty much figure it out. Then you see other people, you see they live a life of giving. They live a life of service. And generally, they're, they're, they're um, generous with their time. They're generous with their energy. They're generous with their money. They're generous, a generosity of spirit. A person like that, again, it's not always automatic, but that it opens you up for, because you see the nobility in the human being, the divine expressing itself, that becomes something you feel much more trustworthy. You see the kindness. You see the warmth. You see when it comes to make a decision, it's not always about what's good for me, what's good for us. What's good for the community? Sometimes it may not be so good for me, but it's good for others. When you see that, that's the, those are the ingredients that, you, that are, are there to help you learn to trust somebody. All of us have the capacity to be that way. That's the key thing to know at any time. But often we get trapped in our routines and patterns where me, me, me. Sometimes that comes from because you've seen people around you that all they cared about was themselves. So you say, you know what, they're fending for themselves. I'm fending for myself. When you're with the sharks, you have to behave like a shark. That still doesn't mean that the divine part is not there. It means it's undercover. It's, not, it's like a muscle that's not used. So for a person to really actualize themselves, we should be thinking about you know, can also actualizing that part of myself. As far as your others go around, when you see a person that's doing that, yes, there's less reason to trust when you see a person's dominated and controlled by that me, me, me voice. But again, that doesn't mean it's not there. It just means they're not exercising it. Sometimes people learn from each other. If you're in an environment where people are giving, it often elicits from you the giving component in you. So what is the key ingredient that actually helps a person choose one over the other? It's a, point, it's a word that I often use, a Hebrew word from the Hasidic lexicon called bittel. Bittel. It's a form of uh, translated modesty, humility, suspension of self, getting the self out of the way, thinking more what is good than whether it's good for me. It's like in the mind, we have in the Kabbalistic terminology, if you're familiar with the Sefirot, there's Chachma and Bina, wisdom and understanding. One of the differences between them is wisdom is the idea is tr- it resonates. Bina is I understand. There's the I. So not to say that's necessarily a bad thing, but once the I is in there, there's another force at work. So the same thing is in everything in life. Is it good or is it good for me? Now it could be both, but if the full criteria is only whether it's good for me, then there are going to be situations where you, others will be compromised because it may not be good for you, but it may be good for others or may be good for the cause and it may be good for the community. So bittel is one of those features that comes in the soul itself, in the divine soul, that is part of our beings when we love people in a healthy way, when we are committed to people in a healthy way, that tool emerges because what do you do? There's sacrifices you make. And then that may not even be considered a sacrifice. It could simply be that you overlook certain things because you're more transcendent by nature, and especially someone that you care about, and you don't really mind. So bittel is the key component that really defines how a person, if a, in other words, a bittel dicka person is a trustworthy person. A non bittel dicka person, meaning more arrogant or egoistic, egocentric instead of God-centric, egocentric instead of good-centric, meaning good for other-centric, then you get into the areas of lack of trust. Why? You could say, for a while you may trust somebody. You know, you can be with someone that's very arrogant and selfish, but you're benefiting from it. But that's selfish benefit. At some point, there's going to be a clash. So bitl becomes one of the ways to measure and to determine if a person has that nature, that personality, that generosity, as I said, of spirit. In other ways, this expresses itself, and it's not difficult to see if you look closely, then this is a person you can begin to learn to trust. Now, when I say look look closely, (laughs) if you yourself are blinded because you yourself are narcissistic and selfish, it's probably going to be hard to see someone like that. Or if you see someone like that, you look at them as some type of sucker that you can take advantage of. So it does take one to know one, meaning you have to have some sense of sensitivity and subtlety 
to recognize a person who's this bitl dik, a person who has this element of generosity and giving as opposed to taking. But I think there's no person on earth, even people who sometimes behave in ways that are quite atrocious, that will say, no, selfishness is better than selflessness. Yes, there are people who have developed cynicism and they say selfish, selflessness gets you nowhere. I've only been hurt by it. But that's because they've been hurt. Everybody knows that in, as an aspiration, as an ideal, as a standard, the, that, that part of us that has the capacity to give, the capacity to overlook our own interests for the help of others, not compromising ourselves. I'm not talking about annihilating, annihilating oneself because that's also unhealthy. But in a healthy way, out of strength, out of strength, deferring, being flexible, yielding. Like the Talmud, like the, one of the, say, the expressions is, a person should always be yielding. Rach kakana, soft, like a, like a reed. Ava altehe kosha ka'aras. And don't be hard and inflexible like a cedar tree. Very powerful, but it's inflexible. So this yielding means you're there, but you're able to bend in the wind, you're able to... You're resilient, you're able to adjust, you have the flexibility, you're able to take a punch and not be destroyed by it. You know when to be, exercise restraint. These are all features that create the climate and environment for trust. So when you say restoring trust in humanity, yes, it's believing in yourself and believing in the divine dimension in yourself and in others, believing that collectively we can access that, and actually we have to be pioneers and not wait for others to do to act on that. When we act on that, it has a certain viral effect. It has a certain, um, I would even say, contagious effect, a positive way, because people that are around things like that, it tends to bring out the best in them. And that's our responsibility. So in the world in which we live, on one hand, as, as Steven Pinker writes in his book, with unbelievable advancements, Yes, there are unbelievable advancements. And, but there is also a part of us that's very, very self-contained. We are very self-indulgent in our time. And we are selfish. Because sometimes prosperity and comforts create that. Because you, have become, you take it for granted, you get spoiled. Sense of entitlement. But I want to now go back to Pinker's argument. And uh, what, what I would say, let's say the Holocaust survivor's argument. Which one is it? I think we have here a problem with extremes. It is true that there were people, and maybe many people, that were dominated by primitive beliefs, and they thought some father in heaven or some magical thing or some other supernatural thing controls their lives. So that's a childish thing, and you could say we matured from that. That's the enlightenment, as its name indicates. Enlightening. We've seen the light, they lived in the dark, we've seen the light, and we realize that it's more complicated than that. There's science, there's reason, there's free inquiry, and we don't necessarily need to depend and explain everything by a supernatural God, which is exactly what the Enlightenment introduced, and went to basically to war, dismissing anything value of faith and religion. What was wrong with that? Because at the end of the day, human beings no matter how advanced they are, have a selfish side to them. So it could be that they will create, yes, great things and human races today, a far more evolved race and there's more humanitarianism, humanitarianism and there's giving and charity and many other things, less wars as Pinker documents in his book and is documented in many other places. But the human being at the heart, are we less selfish people? And what checks that? And look at the Nazis they were not a third world country. They prided themselves on their philosophy, on their sciences, on their arts, on their music, on their culture. And yet, they ended up using all that science and technology to find the most efficient way to kill innocent children, men, women, and children, just because they felt that they were not up to par. So to state that Pinker's argument that is due to the Enlightenment is working? No, 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 no. That's going to the other extreme. So to say that it's completely based on supernatural, no, because part of God's wishes is that he created a human being in the divine image, a human being with intelligence, with emotions, and we have tools and resources, yes, to create an enlightenment and many things, but we never forget that all the reason in the world always needs a foundation 
an axiom that is super rational. Because it's not just about logic. If you go with logic, you can come up with horrendous conclusions that some people deserve to die. Why should we help, why should we help the, the weak and the, and, the, and the feeble or the aged, mentally retarded, as the Nazis did? You can come up with all kinds of logic why we should reserve resources, medical resources and other resources, just to save the best, the youngest and the best, the most, well, well, uh, most able-bodied young people. The Aryan race. You need to always have something higher. As the founding fathers fully understood, all men are created equal. And due to that, have inalienable rights endowed to them by the Creator. That's where the Enlightenment can go off. Where they completely move it to human beings. Then I would never trust humanity. Look what humanity did. On the other hand, should we go back and say, you know what, human beings can't do anything, it's all about God? That's not what God wanted. He wanted a partner, a partner in creation. Gave human beings intelligence, gave them resources, a partnership. So it's not one extreme or the other, only God or only human. I wrote once a series of articles. What, one was, it's, uh, what was it called? It's all about God or it's all about man? Something like that. You can find it online on MeaningfulLife.com. Now you need both. You need the combination of both. Look at the currency of the United States. In God, we trust. You can't say, man, we trust because you cannot trust. You can't trust human beings. because They're in the same boat like us. How could you trust someone that's like you, mortal like you, weak like you, biased and prejudiced, and can do things for self-interest? How could you trust that entirely? But they went overboard and they began to overtrust because they so rejected the church and the belief and the faith of so-called primitive faith, they thought the only thing is now left the human. And religion didn't go away as it was predicted by the Enlightenment. Because there are elements in it that are necessary. The absolute morality that science cannot provide. The guide, the compass of what is right and what is wrong, which again, science and reason cannot always provide. It can augment, it can support, it can make a case for. But you need to have foundations that are unwavering. So you want to have really restoring trust in the human in humanity, you're trusting restoring faith in humanity. You need to have a combination of knowing the human, the divine within the human, because you connect to the divine of the divine, and that counters the ugly within the human. So to just say restoring faith in humanity without that element, no. So basically, it would be put this: way. we trust humans when humans defer to their divine side, then yes, we trust them, because then, by extension, they are, just like we trust the divine, we can trust the human who is, has the bittle, has the humility, and, the, and the, is a channel for that higher reality. So it's not just trusting God and not trusting humans, and it's not just trusting humans and not trusting God, it's understanding they work hand in hand. It's like you say, you know what, I don't want to deal with a worker, I want to deal with a boss. But the boss sent this worker, sent this messenger to you. But the messenger you sense, he's a messenger of the person who sent him. Then you say, you know what, just like I trust the boss, I trust this person. But if he's an entity on his own and does what he wants, you say, why would I trust him? How do I, how do I know what his agenda is? Or her agenda? So, th- so a topic which seems on, 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 the, on the face, you'd say, you know what, we don't trust people, or we do trust people really opens up the door to an entire discussion of what makes us tick, who are we, and recognizing that you need to have a combination of both elements. And it's interesting, even in science, raw science, which you could say is not based on any faith, nevertheless has been established that the purest sciences, physical sciences, are all based on super-rational axioms. Godel, the famous mathematician, proved that mathematics, which was the purest science, everything is proven. Its axioms are not provable. In physics, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, that in a certain, sub- a certain subatomic level, on the quantum level, certain things are not deterministic. They're probabilities. And you can go through many areas in life and you find the same thing. Einstein, the theory of relativity. Why? 
because what we establish is recognizing that it's not always black and white because it's built on things that are higher than our rational. Not lower, not irrational. But it's not purely always based on pure rational. Karl Popper said that something scientific has to be able to be proven. A scientific theory has to be able to be proven, but also has to be able to be disproven. So, for example, the statement God exists is not scientific because you can't disprove it. You may not be able to prove it, absolutely, but you can't disprove it. But in life, there are many things when it comes to things like love, truth, soul. These are not provable things. These are resonating experiences that resonate with truth. Can someone, for example, give me absolute proof that all that we see and everything that exists, including our minds and including our logic and including this discussion, including all its proofs, is not one big illusion? Maybe it's an illusion. Whatever you'll say can also be part of the illusion. Just because someone pinches you and you feel it, that's part of the illusion. It's a program, the matrix. Can someone disprove that? And yet, the way we'll disprove it is by saying, I just don't feel it right. I do feel my existence is there. I feel others exist. I do feel it matters. And I don't know about the, whether I can prove it scientifically, but I feel it. It's like when you hear music, and the music brings you joy or tears or transcends you, transports you to another time and place. You don't start saying, is it true or not? And you say, so where, where's the rational? The rational is that there's something called experiential proofs. I experienced it. I experienced love. Can I prove to you this love is real? With, if you hook me up to, to sensors, and when, I, when music is played, you see my heartbeat goes up, and the blood pressure goes up, and you sense different dopamine or whatever it is in the mind that begins to be stimulated, that's proof that music touches us. I hear the music. I know it touches me because I know how I feel. Now, can it be manipulated? Of course it could be manipulated. But intelligent people know that too. And you take that all into consideration. So the bottom line, my friends, is this. That humanity has two sides. Two faces. One, the most beautiful possible face. And another is a very ugly face. When Adam and Eve ate from the tree of knowledge, the story goes, God comes into the garden and says, Ayeko, where are you? The famous question, what do you mean, where are you? He didn't know where Adam was. But God was saying, I don't recognize you. You can sit with someone right near them, and they say, where are you? You're not asking them where they are. You're saying, you've spaced out. I don't see you're not with me. And that's what God was saying, which is why it says that an, an animal will never attack a human being. That's why Daniel in the, in the den of lions, in the lion's den, was unscathed. Because they respect the divine image within the human. But then we see animals do attack. The answer is because the divine image has been concealed. When a person behaves not up to par, up to the standard of a human being, they are vulnerable. A person glows with that inner dignity and inner majesty and nobility. The malchus of what defines the human being, it's seen and respected by others. So what we have is that the human being is a complex entity that has both faces, both sides. It's our obvious mission is to embrace the transcendent side and, give, and that gives people faith in us and trust in us. And when we're that way, it often affects and spills over to others that they too can be trusted. But it's work. And that's how we ultimately restore the trust in humanity, the faith in humanity. Not because humans can be trusted, but because when humans live up to what a human can be, the divine within the human, the divine can be trusted. So there's a big mistake. When I read, that, when I read the Pinker's article, well, it, was, it was an excerpt from the book, and then parts of the book, it was very disturbing to me. Because a very intelligent man, and very good arguments. But to cut out the divine is to cut out the best of who we are. Now I understand where it's coming from because religion has been, has been taxified and has been, religion has been used in an abusive way. And religion itself has become an abusive force for many people, if not an irrelevant one. But, when you, but, but that's like throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Fine. The part of it that's abusive, the part is, is man-made. That too is part of the human problem. Humans who took religion, took control over religion, is like ultimately the human taking control of the divine and saying, it's my God, not your God, and I will kill you and be intolerant of you and be judgmental and condescending because you're not like I am. That's, goes against, that, that goes against the grain of the entire mission and message. 
you, a real faith person of faith will have real humility and real tolerance and real acceptance and real coexistence and will always look to inspire, not to destroy. Will always look to lift people up, warm them with his greater light. So to throw that away? I would even argue, though they've not accepted that many of the enlightenment, they don't call it God, they call it something else. They call it their love of nature, their love of beauty, of aesthetics, of romance, of love, of free inquiry. To me, that's just another name for God. And one that's safer for them, so be it. But it's basically recognizing a deeper truth to something, a deeper inner truth. I'm not going to replace and say romance equals God, but it's a godly type of experience. It's like the doctor I've talked about a number of times who I know. He's a research doctor, and he took upon himself a few illnesses that were incurable till now. And in his lifetime, he wants to cure them. Not, not the major ones. Some, some illnesses. One that one of his family members died from. And he is, calls himself an atheist. When he comes to my classes and asks him, you're an atheist, you come to my class, he says, your God I have no problem with. Like Levi Yitzhak Badit said, the God you don't believe in, I also don't believe in. And I said to him, how do you know you're going to really heal these, find, you know, you spend so much time and money and so much commitment to finding a cure for these illnesses. How do you know you're going to find it? He says, absolutely. When there's a will, there's a way. A person applies themselves. Human beings have that power. You see, they've learned how to fly. We've learned all kinds of things that were once considered impossible. So, I mean, I was, of course, leading him up, setting him up for the punchline. And I said, you know what? You're bigger, more religious and more fanatic than I am. Remember, the word for fan is, fan, fan is short for fanatic. But you know, never hear anyone say sports fanatic and religious fan. He says, what are you talking about? I said, because your commitment. You don't call God, you call the power of healing. Fine. So it's just a matter of semantics. It's a belief of an absolute power. If someone believes that human, human beings, with their minds and with their will, and with their determination, can, mar- can continue to lead the march of pro- progress, the march, the, start- the march of human progress through history, and with that type of absolutely conf- con- absolute confidence, they can conquer every illness, co- vanquish famine, vanquish poverty. That is a trust in something that's more than just rational. It means you believe in a certain ideal. Unfortunately, as I said, God and religion has gotten a bad name and for, for right reasons. People have misused it. What we have to learn is to find that balance. And that's when we restore the faith in humanity and trust in humanity because we're restoring the trust that God has in humanity. That when God created the human being, he took a big risk. He was a gambler. He gave a human being free will. Free will means you can't choose to go against your grain of your own nature and go against the grain of your purpose and mission. It's imagine sending astronauts into space with a mission and giving them free will. They can do whatever they want. They, want, they don't want to dress this way. They don't want to eat the right eat. What will happen? They will ultimately self-destruct. But giving them that free will is the greatest gift because God trusted his partner. And that partnership is that's what we're looking to regain. The trust in that partnership. That partnership is what defines the greatest of what a human being is. And does not negate our intelligence. And it does not negate our own resources. It's the classic story where we rely on ourselves because God gave us the resources to solve a problem. You don't just turn to God and say, I'm completely dependent on you. God will say to you, dependent on me, I gave you everything you need to do what you have to do. The famous, everyone knows this joke about the guy, the city, the town was drowning, flooded, and they were evacuating everyone. And one person says, I'm not going anywhere. I'm waiting for God to save me, a man of faith. And the water began rising, rising. He went up to the second floor. I'm a man of faith. He went up to the rooftop. They sent a helicopter for him. I'm a man of faith. I'm not going. I'm waiting for God to save me. Meanwhile, the water's reaching his neck. Uh, 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 Last chance, the helicopter. No. Well, of course he dies. He goes up to heaven. He says to marches with all adamants into the heavenly court and says to God, I don't understand. Everybody in town ran. I was the only one that stayed because I had complete faith in you. And you forsake me. You never came to save me. And God said, I sent a helicopter three times and many other efforts. Because that's how it works. 
I gave you the resources. It's even better than me saving you. I'm giving you the tools. Now, we have to also realize those are tools given to us, and we shouldn't think we're self-made people, and our tools are self-made. And that's the combination that we need to have. It's a combination of humility, but also confidence through the humility in your skills, in your resources, in your tools, both individually and others. And if you think about it, it's a secret to every healthy relationship. It's not one person doing the job for the other. It's a synergy that comes from the, the sum, more than the sum of the parts of two people doing what they have to do and then having the bitl, the humility, that suspension of self to reach something greater than the, the parts, greater than each of them. So there's a unifying, invisible synergy that connects us. But that requires each of us doing our job. Think of nature, the human body, m- millions of millions and trillions of cells thousands of systems in nature how many species are there and everything that balance on one hand everyone is individual on the other hand they're all working hand in hand symbiotically symbiosis because there's a combination of both recognizing that you are part of some bigger picture but that part of the bigger picture needs you to do your part so it's both an individual plus that collective element the human race seven billion of us are seven billion musical notes or seven billion musicians in one large composition. It's not about me taking, no, no one can take away what you need to do because no one can do what you need to do. But we are always looking out there and saying, come greedy. What you have maybe is mine. No, what you have is what you were given and blessed with what you need. Do your thing. Imagine the heart looking and saying, I want to be the mind. The mind says, I want to be the lungs. The lungs want to be the liver. The liver wants to be the spleen, etc., etc. No, be who you are. And everyone else needs you, and you need them, and it becomes this harmonious unit. It's not a fragment, it's not a, a, um, a bunch of botched together pieces. It's a harmony. When you look at it, you see one beautiful picture. That is the ultimate of humanity. And we're marching there, and we're headed there, and please God, we will reach that place. But we have to do our part. Today we have so many gifts and so many blessings. Yes, we do not have to run for our lives. We don't have the wars that were once existent. But we still have our challenges, apathy, self-indulgence, greed, selfishness. Recognizing this part in yourself, the beauty in you as a human, the beauty in another human, joining together, complementing each other, is the key, is the call of the hour. So may we all be blessed with the fortitude, with the clarity, with the wisdom, and sensitivity to live a life that is both expressing who you are, but yet also doing it with humility, doing it with a recognition that you are part of one bigger divine composition. And we need each other, and every part needs you. And we complement each other in that fashion until we come to the, yes, the true brotherhood and sisterhood of humanity, where we can trust all of humanity and every individual. Thank you very much. This has been Simon Jacobson. We're here every Wednesday, approximately 8.30 p.m. And we're on Facebook, so please share, like, friend, pass us on. Give us, send us your comments. Same thing with um, uh, YouTube. We're on YouTube as well, and all the other channels. I also want to say this is a public service. A lot of work and preparation goes in preparing these programs and classes. We really depend on community sponsorship, on you. So if you have a special date, a birthday, or anniversary, or a yard site, or any other thing you'd like to honor, what a good way to do so, reaching thousands of people with this type of message. And please go to meaningflive.com slash sponsorship, and you can find many ways to sponsor things. If you want to talk to us, just call us on that number. That's there as well. Or email us. And please, we do depend on your, on your support to make these things continue to grow and develop them further expand, and develop even more programs. Of course, any suggestions, comments, critique is also welcome. Just go to MeaningfulLife.com and please send us a note. and We'd love to hear from you. So again, everyone have a very blessed week, a very harmonious week that combines the individuality and the, and the bigger picture in trusting and loving and faithful way. Thank you. Be well.